If you have your Bible with you, turn to Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22. As we're turning there tonight, in Proverbs chapter 22, see if you remember what we read right there at the beginning of the entire service. We learned that God's word would go forth and it will not return unto him void, but it will what? It will prosper and it will accomplish. It will prosper and it will accomplish. So in a moment when we get to read God's word and I have an opportunity to preach it, ask God as I pray that it will accomplish in your heart what he has for it to do. Get this going here. If you found your way tonight to Proverbs chapter 22, we're going to begin at verse number 1. It says this, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and love and favor rather than silver and gold. The rich and poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Thorns and snares are in the way of the froward. He that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. The rich will live over the poor, and the borrower is servant the lender. He that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity, and the rod of his anger shall fail. Father, we thank you for the opportunity tonight to read your word, uh, to spend time in your word. Lord, I thank you for calling me into the ministry, Lord, and giving me the opportunity to preach your word. I don't believe there's any higher calling. I don't take that for granted, Lord. I just pray that tonight you would make me your mouthpiece. You would say through me, Lord, to the hearts of the people uh, what you would have said, Lord, that it will prosper and it will accomplish what you have it to do. Lord, help us to see tonight your word, Lord, your way. Lord, help us to know your will. Lord, help us to think on you and to do what you would have us to do. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you're in the habit of taking notes tonight, uh, the, title, if, the title, if you take notes, is Choosing the Choice Things. Choosing the Choice Things. I had a little introduction here. I want to read it a little bit. It says, we make choices every day. Oatmeal or eggs? Coffee? Would you like that regular decaf? What to wear? Choices, choices, choices. Think about this. Do you want scrambled eggs and sausage this morning? Or would you have the, rather have maggots with dirt? For breakfast. Mm. Do you want a nice new F-150? Free and clear. And I know maybe there's some Chevy and Dodge guys in here. Just, just play along, okay? Would you rather have the nice new F-150 free and clear? Or a rusted out, beat up Pinto that can't even start? Would you rather have a 2,000 square foot, four bedroom, three bath house? Or do you prefer the closest cardboard box underneath the closest underpass or overpass? Would you rather have that? One set of decisions, the first one, is difficult because the options are so close. I mean, I like oatmeal, I like eggs, I like coffee, I, mean, I, I like these things. These are hard things to decide between. But the next one is, not so, is, is easy because one option is so much better than the next. I mean, if I said you can have scrambled eggs and sausage, over maggots with dirt. I think everybody in here, unless they want to be a smart aleck, would say, hey, I would rather have scrambled eggs and sausage. I don't think anybody in here would say, I like maggots for breakfast. Anybody? Maggots for breakfast? I don't think so. Doctor. Daniel's raising his hand. There we go. <laughs> smart, our smart one today. No, but I don't think that's not a hard decision. We don't have to spend a lot of time thinking about that. But tonight, as we examine the Word of God in Proverbs chapter 22, we need to see... Uh, I, I want us to see, I, I have, the Lord put this on my heart, choosing the choice things. I'm not trying to make a, be difficult with the words, but I want to define those. Okay, to choose, think about this. To choose is to select from a number of possibilities, to pick by preference. I mean, we know what choosing is. Uh, I became better at choosing my own clothing after I got married. My wife said, this doesn't go together, and you know, this, we're throwing this away, you're never wearing this again. It became easier to choose what I was supposed to wear. Uh, I had a little difficulty when I was in college, those of you ladies who probably think this is pretty funny, 
One morning, I was uh, my freshman year of college, I had class at 7.30, so I woke up early and I couldn't turn on the lights because all the upperclassmen would have beat me up. Uh, but I pulled out my nice black dress pants and a nice navy blue coat and I put a tie on and I stood, I, I kind of, one guy was kind of groggily waking up. I said, does this look good together? And he just, oh yeah, go ahead. You know, he wasn't awake. And so all day I spent at college, you know, I put a nice Bible college with a navy blue coat on and black pants. If you don't know, those don't go together. It didn't look real good. I didn't know the choices that I was supposed to make. Now I don't make that same choice, that same mistake. My wife would definitely correct that point. Thank you, dear. Uh, but think about that. We make choices every day. You chose what to put on. Most of you did, unless your mom dressed you or something like that. Uh, but you make choices what to put on. You made a choice to be here tonight. Uh, you make choices every day. And we see, uh, we want to look at the choices that we make in the Word of God in this chapter. So we choose to select from a number of possibilities to pick by preference. But the title says, Choosing the Choice Things. Choice. It's an adjective. I know what, there's going to be the noun choice, but the adjective means worthy of being chosen, excellent, superior, carefully selected. Remember that list of, uh, of selection we had? You know, uh, we talked about the, the nice new truck compared to the beat up old Pinto. You know, between those two, unless you're a dummy, you pick the nice new truck. It's free and clear, it's just given to you. You want something that's nice. It's, it's, pick, it's the choice among those two. It's the best one. Well, we want to choose the choice things in life. Okay, look at Proverbs 22, verse number 1. The first thing that we want to see is a good name. It says, a good name is rather to be chosen. Okay, there's your choose. than great riches and love and favor rather than silver and gold. The word rather, that's your choice. That's the best. It's choosing one thing over another. So a good name. That's the testimony. It's chosen. You know, a good name is chosen. We choose what our testimony is. We choose, uh, we choose how we're going to be remembered. Our words, our actions and decisions go into the making of our name. Do you, do you know that tonight? You know, uh, maybe you have one name at church. And a different name at home, or a different name at work. I, tr I want to try and strive to have my, the, my name to be a good name wherever I go. You know, we ought to be desire to want that. We ought to desire to have a good testimony. It's more than just saying a good name, but that's our testimony. That's our reputation. That's our character. You know, what does God think of you? It's a good name. A good name is chosen. You have to make that decision. I have to make that decision. Uh, I talked about words and actions and decisions. All these go into that. Am I going to choose the right words? When discussions and jokes and things are being made at the workplace, when uh, they're being made if I'm just at my hobby, on the ball field, or wherever it may be, when those things are being said that we shouldn't be a part of, are you going to play into it or are you going to take some time to walk away? You know, that gets noticed. People notice that. I've, I've seen that happen where they notice, oh, they're not... They don't say these things that we say. And you develop that choice name. You develop that reputation. Our actions, our decisions. Are you the kind person? Are you the nice person? Are you the one that is quick to, to be down on somebody? We have, to, we have to protect our name against these things. Can I tell you, not only is it's chosen, it's our reputation, but we need to understand that even though it can take a long time to build that reputation, it can only take a short time to destroy it, can it? Right. I mean, we build, spend all the, the months and years building up a reputation and our testimony, and if we're not careful, we let something happen, we get involved in sin, and our reputation is shot. And then we don't have that influence that we could have had. They say, well, I already know what you did. And, and they won't listen to you because our reputation is shot. But can I tell you, tonight we see that word chosen. And, and church, are you choosing a good name? Maybe that maybe that's not something you've thought of before. But you choose the name you have. And we choose that with our words and our actions and our attitudes. Are you choosing a good name? And then we see the word rather. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. Can I tell you tonight? You know, God's Word is telling us it's better to have a 
good testimony. It's better to have a good testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ than to have all the riches in the world. You know, riches gotten by evil, it's not, it's not uh, I'm sure if, if we took the time, uh, we could come up with names of people that we know that are well off financially, but they're not rich in the kingdom. They're not rich in their testimony. There's a man in our, in our city here that owns all the, the nasty places here in town. I'm sure he has more money than I do, but he's not on his way to heaven like I am. And I thank the Lord for I mean, I hope that someday he'll come to Christ. But I would rather have a good name. I'd rather have my name known by Jesus Christ and in the Lamb's Book of Life than have all that money, to have all those toys, to have all those pleasures. A good name is rather to be chosen. It's chosen. It's a choice. But it's also the choicest things. It's, it's, cho it's to be chosen over great riches and over silver and gold. We want that loving favor. We want, do you want the loving favor of God? You know, I like that somebody had, I don't know if they wrote it down or I saw a saying somewhere, I just heard somebody say it. He said, I know God loves everybody, but I sure feel like I'm His favorite. You know, sometimes I'm like, you know, it's good to feel that way. To know you're in the favor of God. I don't think it's prideful to say, I know God loves me. You know, that's a good thing. We ought to all, all be able to say, I know God loves me. He's looking out for me. And I'm not trying, I mean, we don't, uh, we don't want to worship the, the creation over the Creator and, and brag on all our stuff. I'm not saying that. That's, not, that's idolatry. But let's understand that, that God gives us loving favor and it's a choice. Our decisions, our actions. A good name is chosen. It's choice. So look at there. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. The rich and poor, verse 2, the rich and poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. Can I tell you tonight, there are some things we can choose, but I don't think any of us in here chose where we'd be born, what family we would be born into. That's not a decision that we get to make. Uh, but can I tell you, we, we have a whole lot to do with what comes later, don't we? I, I'm going to read you a couple names here from the Bible. You tell me whether it was good or whether they were good characters or bad, okay? How about Joseph? Good. Good character, right. I mean, he wasn't born in riches, was he? But he did something, and his name, we know his name. I mean, it was in the Word of God, but we know he's good. Okay, how about Cain? Bad. It's bad, right. Now, he was born to the richest parents on all the earth. You say he was born to the only parents on all the earth. But, I mean, he had every opportunity to be a good guy. But he didn't take those opportunities. Okay, how about Abel? Good, right. He off, you know, his, his offering was better than Cain's, and that's why Cain got jealous and slew him. How about John the Baptist? Good, good. You better say good. We're Baptist, amen. John the Baptist. No, but we know. He spoke out from the Lord. You know, but did he, wear, I, did he wear a nice suit and tie? No. If you see him, he was, it was camel skin. He ate locusts and wild honey. I mean, sometimes I, I'd, I'd like to meet John the Baptist someday in heaven. I, I want to talk to him. So here's some stories from him. He's an interesting fellow. John the Baptist, he's a good guy. What about King Herod? Yeah. Now wait a minute, he's a king. He's a the rich people love the rich. I mean, he's a king though. He's supposed to be, no. It doesn't matter where you, whether you're born in riches or in poverty. The good name doesn't come from that. The good name is what we make of it. It's what, we're, what we do with our, what we do with our actions, with our words. We're not, we may not choose where we're born into, but we can choose to do the right thing with what we're given. So we understand that. Look at verse number 3. So we see a, a name can be chosen. It can be choice. But then look at verse number 3. It says, A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. A prudent man, that's a wise man, a smart man, a prudent man uh, foresees the evil. He sees it. He's alert to the dangers and temptations around him. You know, the prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself. Can I put that in the context of sin and temptation? Ladies and gentlemen tonight, I think all of us probably know and are familiar with what our pet sins are. And by pet sins, I don't mean like this, you know, feed them and water them and things like that we should do for a pet, I guess. But what I'm saying is we know what sins we are more prone to fall to. Uh, whether it's temptations of the flesh, whether it's gossip, whether it's listening or watching the wrong things, we know what we're tempted with. And, and can I see a show of hands? You know, uh, 
Maybe how you're tempted with that? Anybody here? You know uh, a time that you're tempted? Anybody? I, what I mean by that is there are things that you can see that you can avoid to avoid that temptation. You ever been there? I got a couple of hands. Okay, at least that's a, that's a few there. So there's temptations that we have, whatever that sin might be that you're tempted to be a part of, and you can see that temptation, and the prudent man or the prudent woman foresees the temptation, foresees the evil, evil and says, okay, I don't want to be a part of that, I don't want to fall to that, I'm going to go a different direction. I'm going to hide myself. I'm going to go somewhere else. I'm going to be with another group. I can think of people come to my mind that I've worked with. If I didn't want to hear the jokes, and I didn't want to hear the language, and I didn't want to be a, a part of the gossip, then I could say, okay, I know what they're talking about. Uh, I don't want to be a part of that, so let me go talk to these other people. Maybe you know somebody like that. Hopefully you're not that person that they're like, oh, I know that person. I need to avoid them. You know, but our good name, what are you known as? How are we known? Uh, a prudent man foresees the evil and hides himself. But the simple pass on and are punished. Now in this context, the simple man, the simple woman, says, oh, there's temptation. I think I'll go shake its hand. They're passing on. They, they pass all the alerts, all the warning signs, and they pay the consequences. Can I tell you just a little uh, confession? Yes, and this was an honest mistake, but I still have to suffer the consequences. Yesterday, I was driving down a road, a nice country road, and you know, if, if you're familiar with the laws, as far as I knew, the speed limit was 55 because on a country road it's 55 unless otherwise posted. Well, as I'm coming up a hill, I look to my left and there's a road, flipping road. Now, I find a little humor in that name. And so I'm seeing, oh, flipping road, that's funny. Lo and behold, across the, across the street from flipping road, there's a speed limit sign that says 40. But I didn't see that sign, okay? And so I come over the hill doing 58, okay? So that's three miles over. 55 what I thought it was, okay? But I'm doing 58, and I come over the hill, and I'm cruising along, and there's this black SUV driving the same direction. And I'm just cruising along 55 or 58 miles an hour, thinking it's 55 miles an hour, and that black SUV gets over on the other lane and slows down, and I'm thinking, I sure hope that they're okay. I hope they don't need help. Is there something in the road that I don't see? And as I drew closer, I saw, that is a sheriff's car. I bet I'm about to get pulled over. And as I went by them, sure enough, he blinked on his red and blue lights, and I turned on my blinker, and I pulled him to the gas station, and the officer got out and said, do you know why I pulled you over? And honest mistake, I didn't know it was 40 miles an hour. I said, no, officer, I sure don't. And he said, well, I clocked you back there doing 58. Apparently, they have radar that goes to the back now. I didn't know that either, so now you know. Oh, but he said, I clocked you doing 58 in a 40, and I'm thinking, oh, boy, I'm in big trouble here. And so we got to talking a little bit, and he, he ended up being lenient and didn't give me that big a ticket. But the point I'm trying to make is, we see a prudent man foresee the evil, and I'm not calling cops evil, I'm not saying that, and hide himself, but you know we're all guilty of this. Somebody blinks you on the highway, you're like, oh, there's a police officer ahead, I better slow down. You foresee the situation, and you slow down. Anybody do that? Okay, I got some hands up. Some rest of you are like, oh, no, I, I never do that. I never do that. Okay, liars. Uh, it says, uh, the prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple, that was me yesterday. Oh, I'm lotty dog, checking out the countryside, flipping road, that's pretty funny. I missed the speed limit sign, because I turned around after he told me that, and I went back to see where the speed limit sign was. And sure enough, I should have seen it. I should have been more alert. The simple, that was me, pass on and are punished. I'm getting punished. I have to face the consequences. But can I tell you, I'd much rather get that speeding ticket than to suffer the consequences of sin. It's much worse to go ahead and not be alert, to ignore the, the, the alarms, and to ignore the warning signs that we're given as simple people and just pass on and we face the consequences of our actions. You know, you say, well, I've never seen the signs. The signs in the Word of God. The signs in the people around you. I know people tonight that if they just do the right thing and they, they hadn't ignored the signs, they wouldn't be in the bad situation they're in right now. If they just listen. Can I tell you, every Sunday and on Wednesday nights when the Word of God is proclaimed, that's the signs that's being put out there saying, stop, slow down, there's curves ahead, there's danger ahead. We need to be the prudent man. 
that foresees evil and hides ourselves. We avoid that temptation. We do the right thing. We, we, we don't want to be the simple that pass on and are punished. So we can, um, the choice there, you can choose to be prudent, you can choose to be simple. But choose the choicest thing, you choose to be the prudent man. He goes on to say this in verse number 4. It says, By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Can I tell you, I don't know, I don't think that here riches, and so, I mean, I don't have abundant riches and things like that. But I'd rather have the riches of the Lord, to be rich in the Word, to be rich in knowing I have eternal life, by the way. That says an honor and life that comes through humility. Turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. A great example of humility. The greatest example of humility is this. It says in Philippians chapter 2, verse, verse number 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He humbled himself. He had that humility. You know a good definition for humility? came right from Scripture in verse number 7, made himself of no reputation. You know, he didn't try and claim the best spot. I think about sometimes we're assigned uh, different tasks at work, and a lot of people, I'm not going to do that. They don't pay me enough to do that. I'm not going to go in there and clean that up. You know, it's, it's not not humility. It's, I'm better than everybody else. It's, I, I deserve this. You know, we don't deserve anything but hell. I mean, that's what we deserve. We need to be more humble. Don't think we, we ought not think ourselves to be uh, so great. You know, we, we serve a Savior who is great, and the only good things that we have are from the Lord. Let's not think that we need to be proud, that we need to exalt ourselves. When we do that, we try and lift our names up and magnify ourselves. When, when, we, when we look bigger, Christ looks smaller, doesn't He? You know, it goes in proportion there. Humble yourself. Make Christ magnified. The Bible says that those that love salvation will magnify the Lord. I mean, we need to magnify Him. Magnify the Lord. Make Him, make him larger in your life. Are you going to choose humility? What's the opposite of humility? Pride. The Bible says that pride goeth before destruction and the haughty spirit before a fall. You know, we get proud. Another little quick illustration for you. I remember uh, when I was, uh, I think I was in 10th grade, and there was a reward for these feather pins that we were in a, we were doing a play, a Christian Christmas carol, and I was Ebenezer Scrooge. But my pastor's wife had lost the feather pins, and she was offering a $2 reward to find the feather pins. And I happened to find the feather pins, and being the dramatic person that I am, and very happy that I found the feather pins and claimed the $2 reward, I jumped from the platform saying, I have found the... And lo and behold, I did not know that day that they had put up the stage curtain. And so as I jumped out from the platform, I hit the stage curtain, and surely pride came uh, goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. I ended up on my back. The feathers. I found the feathers. But, you know, just a little illustration. I, I fell down because I got prideful. You know, I remember that. It helps me. It's a reminder. Don't be proud. Be humble. Make of yourself no reputation. Don't try and lift yourself up. That's a choice we have to make. And the choicest thing is to be humble. To have the mind of Christ. Then look at verse 5. Thorns and snares are in the way of the froward. He that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. The word froward means crooked or perverse. That's not a good word. You don't want to be the froward person. Okay, so thorns, uh, by the way, anybody like it when you get stuck by thorns? I didn't think so. Thorns and snares. Have you ever been choked or tangled up in the vines? You've been snared? You've been trapped? The Bible says that those are in the way of the froward. He that to keep his soul shall be far from them. You know, the way of the froward man, the crooked, the perverse man, as he goes along, and then man or woman, they go along and they think their path looks good. But when I think of the thorns, 
I think, of the pain of sin. Yeah, they saw the pleasures of sin, but then they received the pain of sin. I think of, they saw the pleasures of sin, but they didn't see the snares. There was no one warning them that the snares were ahead. And they, they simple passed on and were punished. And you can use your imagination tonight, the pain and the snares of a sinful life. If, you're, if you have your eyes open at all, you can see that. I think a little, little illustration with that. On the front, notice this, and not if you're driving because you don't want to be looking over your shoulder like that. But as you drive, you'll see the front of a billboard. It might advertise alcohol or a, or a, you know, like a alcohol or cigarettes or a, a dirty joint, you know, a gentleman's club, quote unquote, no gentleman in there. Uh, but you see the, the glamour on the outside. It looks really nice. But as you go by, you know what's on the back? It's just rotted wood. It's not very pretty to look at. That's what's, that's what's put before us. And the way of the forward man, he sees the outside. He sees, oh, this looks good. But he's deceived because he doesn't know that on the flip side, it's just rotted. It's just rotten. They don't see that, but that's what it ends up. I've seen many a person that's been rotted by a life of sin. They say, oh, I'm 25, and they look 42. Or, or they say, oh, I'm 42, and they look like they're about 80 years old. Because sin wears us down. Sin destroys us. The thorns and snares of sin. Or, what did verse 5 say at the end? He that doth keep his soul shall be far from him. Keep your finger there, but turn back to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4, verse number 23. A great verse for, to, to memorize. It says this. In Proverbs 4, 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. We have to guard our heart. You guard your heart. You know, uh, back in the old days, they built forts and they built castles and things like that. Great big old walls to keep out the intruder. To keep out the enemy. And we need to keep out the enemy. But you know what else the castles had? They had gates. It let the right ones into the gates. Into the city. Into the castle. We need to keep our hearts with all diligence. To guard our hearts from sin. From temptation. But let God's Holy Spirit in. Let Him feed us. Let Him guide us. Let Him uh, be the one that, that tells us who to lift the gate for, so to speak. Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. That was verse number 5. Thorns and snares are in the way of the forward. He that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. Guard your heart. Keep your heart with all diligence. Verse number 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Go back to... Uh, keep in mind that verse, and keep your fingers there, but go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy 6. That's toward the beginning of your Bibles. In Deuteronomy 6, it says this. Deuteronomy 6, verse number 6. Let's look at actually verse number 4. We'll start there. Deuteronomy 6, verse number 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Understand that if we love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, all our might, then His words will be in our heart. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. That's diligently training a child in the way he should go. I have a, one little child, and she's almost one year old. She's not quite old enough to understand when I try and preach the Bible through. No, I read a little bit to her, and we'll, we'll talk to her, and things like that. And I, I already started praying that God would uh, let us lead her to Christ, I hope, at an early age. And I remember telling her, someday I hope to introduce you to my friend Jesus. Well, she didn't understand that, but it's true. I hope to introduce her to Jesus someday. But can I tell you, if God is only the God of my spare moments, then I have not trained up a child in the way he should go, the way she should go. If God is only my God on Sunday at 10.30 to 12 o'clock and then 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock, if he's only my God then, 
I am not training up a child in the way he should go. You know, a lot of times this verse is quoted or read or preached on and people will say, you still have hope for your kids because you brought them up in church and they'll come back. It's a promise. I don't think that's the way maybe that should be preached because I know the old time period is used that as a warning. However you train your child, whatever you train them to value because they saw mom and dad valued it the most, that's the way they're going to go. It wasn't, uh, uh, I'm not trying to give you a, trying to say you have no hope for young people that have gone away and you know they can return. I hope that God will bring them back. But the Bible says train up a child in the way that he should go and when he is old he will not depart from it. That word train is talking about diligently training. Uh, it's, 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 you know, we read there in Deuteronomy, diligently train when thou sittest down, when thou risest up. We're talking about it in the way. It's an all day thing. You know, remember, don't let don't don't let God be the God of your spare moments. Let God be the God of every moment. Amen. We need that, church. I need that. I have to, you know, it's not any easier being being the, the youth pastor or an associate preacher. It's not any easier for Pastor Green to guard his heart. To, to let God be the God of all his moments. You know, maybe you've heard the saying before, new levels, new devils. It's true. You know, those temptations are real. As some of our young people like to say, the struggle is real. You know. That's for you, Angel. No, but think about this. You know, the struggle is real. The temptations are real. We have to guard our heart. And when it comes to young people, when it comes to children, parents, uh, grandparents, church isn't enough. I mean, I'm glad they're here in church. I'm glad you're here, young people. Church isn't enough. Parents have to do their part at home. A pastor, a youth pastor, and this is something I tried to tell our young people when I was a Christian school teacher, is I'm not here to raise your kids. I'm here to help you enforce the things that you want to do. If you're raising them up in the admonition of the Lord, I'm here to assist in that. That's what I want to help in. I'm not here, you know, the idea was, that, okay, well, we're going to do what we want to do. Now you teach them the Bible. No, God says it's up to our parents. Parents do your part. Grandparents, if there's a parent that's not doing their part, Trying to have a role in that. My grandparents played a huge role in, in bringing me to Christ. So just something to think about. Train your child. Uh, choose the right way. The choicest way. Look at verse number 7. Uh, the rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Can I tell you, I know that's true, because right now I'm a borrower that's trying to pay off the lender. And when we get out of debt, I want to stay out of debt, amen. Uh, I think that we need to choose to be a steward of the money that God, God has given us. Sometimes I look around at people and I see the nice new cars, the nice new house, and I have to remind myself, it's not because they're rich, it's because they're deeply in debt. Okay, now this is not a financial seminar, I'm not a, I'm not a financial guru or anything like that, but I have spent enough time to understand that you know, the borrower is slave to lender. And there are things that you can't do when you're up to your eyeballs in debt. And we're not there. And I thank the Lord we've had an opportunity to pay some of that down. And I think we're almost out. Praise the Lord. But I have more liberty not only to enjoy time with my wife, to enjoy some free time and things that we get to do. But I found there's been more opportunity where we can give to the Lord when we're not deep in debt. That's all free for you. That's just from the Bible. You don't have to say amen or anything. But choose not to be in debt. Choose to be a good steward. Of, of God's money that He's given you. Rebel against the culture. I struggled for a long time as a young person. I was like, man, I need to build my credit. Nobody will give me a credit card. And then I found out once you get a credit card, everybody wants to give you a credit card. I think I probably get two or three offers a week in the mail. To, You're pre-approved for this much. And it's like, no. Snip, 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 snip. Throw it away. You know, because I don't want that. Rebel against the culture. Okay? Uh, be a good steward of God's money. And verse number 8, the last verse we'll take a look at this proverb. He that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity, and the rod of his anger shall fail. Can I tell you there's a, a law, a principle in the Word of God that we cannot escape? And that's the law, the principle of sowing and reaping. Uh, we have some farmers in our midst. So Brother Leonard Serber is here on Sunday morning. He's, he's a farmer. He helps with the farm. And he said they sowed, I think it was 2,000 acres this week. I mean, they planted. And he said they're a third of the way done. they still got a lot more to go. But you know what? If they sowed corn, 
When it's harvest time, they're going to have corn. When they, if they sow soybeans, they're going to have soybeans. Anybody, anybody ever watch the movie Secondhand Lions? Anybody in here? Okay, several of you. I think it's a decent movie. You don't have to watch it if you don't want to. But in that movie, there was a traveling salesman who came by and sell, sold them a lot of seeds. And they planted the seeds and they had it marked different tomatoes and, and celery and all these other things. And then it came in corn. And when it came time to harvest, it was growing up. And he said, now this one looks like corn. Now what's this one? Well, that's tomatoes. Well, it looks a lot like the corn. What's that one? He said, well, that's celery. He said, well, that looks a lot like the corn. And they found out they'd just been sold corn in the seed. And they all had that. They sowed and they reaped corn. That's all they had to reap. Well, church tonight, whatever you sow, you're going to reap. You're going to reap more of it. Are you sowing in iniquity? Are you sowing uh, in iniquity and reaping vanity? Or are you sowing in the right things? Are you sowing in the things that please Christ? Are you investing your time in those things? We need to ask ourselves this. We need to examine ourselves. But can I tell you, there is great news. If you are sowing in iniquity, you don't have to reap vanity if you cut it the crop off now. If you'll turn to Christ, if you'll give it all to Christ, and you'll say, hey, Lord, I don't want to be a part of this anymore. You'll change that direction. Maybe you don't know Christ as your Savior. You have that invitation. Jesus Christ died. Off of those in, in here, I don't see any particularly new faces except for a pastor in Georgia and his wife. And I know you've heard the gospel, amen. Probably preach it every Sunday. But there's good news in the gospel, church. Christ went to the cross for you and I. Amen. He suffered the wrath of God for you and I, so that we don't have to reap iniquity. We don't have to. Or we don't have to reap the vanity of the iniquity that we sown. Christ has said, "Hey, I've taken it upon myself. I have suffered the wrath of God, so that you don't have to." Church tonight, many of you, most of you in here that I know of, proclaim and know Christ as your Savior. Can we act like it? Can we understand tonight? That we don't have to suffer the constant. We don't have to take those all on ourselves. If we're Christians, let's live like it. Let's make the decision tonight that though we may be sowing in iniquity, though we might, uh, even as Christians, hey, we're not going to be sinless. But when we're in that, we don't have to stay in sin either. We don't have to live in sin. We can turn back to Christ and say, okay, Lord, I've wandered far away from home. Now I'm coming home. Lord, I, I've done what I shouldn't do. Maybe I've been playing, dabbling with this. I shouldn't be a part of this, Lord. I recognize it as sin, and I'm running back to you, Jesus. Take me back. I've always found He has. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm glad I have a Savior who loves me unconditionally. He didn't put conditions on me. I, I told the young people this morning, I was a real uh, dweeb when I was in school. I'd tuck in the front of my t-shirt and let the, the back of my t-shirt hang out. And I didn't even wear a belt. That's what you're supposed to do if you tuck in. You know, I didn't know all that. I was not the cool person. But you know what? God loved me even then. He didn't, he didn't, you know, he didn't love, love the, he didn't love me just when I was like the fashionable young man in front of you. No, he loved the one that didn't know how to dress at all. Didn't know how to comb his hair or, or take, wash his feet, you know, all those good things. But he loved me unconditionally. He loves you unconditionally. We have a great God. We have a great God who loves us. He gave himself for us. And now he gives us the word of God. And he says, hey, make the right decisions. Choose the right things. But choose the choicest things. The best things. We could keep going tonight, but there's just several verses just to see that we've already seen. What things should we choose? We need to choose to follow the Lord. Choose to have a right name. Choose to be prudent. Foresee the evil. See the temptations ahead and say, I'm not going to be a part of that. Choose, uh, choose not to be the forward man that falls to the snares and traps of the devil. Choose to train up the child in the way they should go. Choose to be right in our finances. And then finally, choose to sow the right things so that we can reap for the Lord. The Bible says they that sow in tears shall reap. They shall bring, bring in their sheaves. They shall reap in joy. I want to sow for the Lord. 
you know, that, that soul winner, a, a man, a sower went forth to sow. He sowed the Word of God. You know, let's decide to be those types of sowers. Let's sow the Word of God in people's hearts. And let's see what God will do, what He will reap. Let's be a church that has a name in the community for loving the Lord. When I say West Rural Baptist Church, everybody in here probably knows, if you've ever heard of that church, you know they're the ones that go protest veterans' funerals. I don't like that. I don't like that name, Westboro Baptist Church. I don't think they're doing the right thing. I don't want to be known as a church that doesn't do the right thing. But when they see, when, when a person hears Faith Baptist Church of Kokomo, let's be a church that brings honor and glory to the Lord. Let's bring a church, let's be a church that carries the Word of God out and invites people to Christ. Let's do the right thing, church. Let's be the right type of person. Let's choose to have a good name for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you today. I thank you for your word. Lord, I don't feel like I've done it justice, but I pray that you've taken your word, you've used it in a way to challenge and to change hearts, that people will follow you, that maybe where we've been involved in things we shouldn't be involved in, we'll turn from them. That, Lord, maybe we're not involved in the things that we should be involved in. We'll make a decision to do those things, to be involved in, as a soul winner, to be involved in reading the Word of God, to be involved in serving you. Lord, help us to follow you. Help us to obey your Word. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going to have a time of invitation tonight. Mary.